Hello, friends. I met Bill Bowman twice. The first time was when his son Elliot called and, is sa and said that his father was quite ill. He asked if he could bring his father to the synagogue to meet me. Of course, I said, thinking that he might want some prayers for healing or perhaps to talk about end-of-life issues. When I met Bill, there were no obvious signs of illness. He asked me to show him and his son around the synagogue, and then the three of us sat in my office to talk. Bill said that he knew he was in the last stage of his life and was preparing to die. He was calm and clear and seemed very accepting of his situation. He told me that he had a wife, three grown children, and three grandchildren. He had been an electrical engineer and had started two successful companies. He said that some of his most rewarding work had been done in his life around mentoring kids and adults in math, science, English, and computer skills. He asked me some questions and we had a very pleasant conversation. After about an hour, he said that it had been a pleasure meeting me and that he was grateful for the time I had given him. Then he and his son, Elliot, who had hardly said a word, got up to leave. It was only after he left that it dawned on me that Bill was likely looking for a rabbi to conduct his funeral. A colleague asked me about the meeting and remarked that he'd never heard of an interview like this before. I remember responding that while I'd never experienced this, it seemed very natural and had an undeniable logic. Mr. Bowman's clarity and sense of purpose had no artifice or pretension. He simply conducted himself with great dignity. I had this odd feeling that I knew this man and felt a strange sense of loss in not knowing him better. In some inexplicable way, I felt I had just had a brush with the sacred. Months passed and the meeting with Bill and his son Elliot faded into the background of a busy and demanding schedule. Then on a late Thursday afternoon, I received a call from a colleague at the local mortuary. She began by saying that a man named Bill Bowman was near the end of his life. She said that I probably didn't know him, but that he had asked that I go to see him. I told her that I knew exactly who he was and that I was on my way. She told me he was at the Bruns house, a residential home that was transformed into a lovely standalone hospice facility about 15 minutes from my office. When I pulled into the semicircular driveway of the Bruns house, all the available parking was taken. However, a number of people were getting into their cars and I thought I recognized Bill's son, Elliot. I began rolling down my window to speak to him, but something inside me made me resist that temptation. As much as I wanted to connect with the family and offer my support during this challenging time, I felt that there was something right about the timing of my arrival just as they were leaving. One of the nurses greeted me at the door. As Soon as I entered, I sensed the kindness and deep respect in this place for those who have come here at the very end of their lives. The hospice nurse directed me to Bill's room and with the door open, I could see that he was sleeping. I imagined he was exhausted from the ordeal of having been transported from the hospital to hospice and that it had been a very emotional time to spend with his family members. 
I entered quietly and I sat down in a chair next to him. I listened to his deep breathing and began to breathe with him slowly and consciously. I found myself moving into a more meditative state and softly began to sing to him melodies that my mother used to sing to me and my siblings as she put us to bed so many years ago. I felt her kind and loving presence and I shared that energy with this man who I'd only met once before but with whom I felt a warm connection. After about 20 minutes, Bill opened his eyes, listened to the melody I was singing as if he'd heard it before and smiled and said, I'm really glad you're here. It was like visiting an old friend whom I'd known for years. I stood up and shook his hand. He told me how soothing the singing had been. He looked me in the eyes and said to me with astonishing clarity, I have lived a very good life. I am ready. He paused and then added, I have a lot of love in my life. I have a wonderful family. I feel like I have made a difference. He said, I've always tried to do my best at whatever I've done. I believe that's how we were meant to live. He was speaking to me from his heart and he paused to reflect. After a few moments, he said, I think a man's reach should exceed his grasp. I've always tried to live that way. I smiled and asked him if he knew the end of the quote from the poet Robert Browning. He said, tell me. I responded, Browning said it like this. Ah, a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for? A little laugh escaped from his lips. He was so calm. We talked for a while and though I had come to offer him spiritual support, I felt deeply comforted by his serenity. We shared an intimacy that I experienced as a great gift. I didn't want to leave him, but he clearly grew tired. I offered him some blessings, and as I turned to go, he said, please sing me one more song. I sang the threefold blessing of peace. May the blessings of God rest upon you. May God's peace abide with you. May God's presence illuminate your heart now and forevermore. We exchanged a wordless goodbye and just as I was going, he said, What's a heaven for? This has been my wonderful life. I felt so blessed to have been in his presence, to have known him for a very short time with a certainty that I will never forget him. Stay safe and be well. Shalom uvracha. Peace and blessings.